Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 188 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck. You'll have access to hundreds of articles, videos, programs, and the best forum on the net. The strengthcoach.com forum is the best way to connect with Coach Boyle. He's on there every day. And if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. Depending on how many people you got, check it out at shrinkcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Rennan. The show notes are located at shrinkcoachpodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to shrinkcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, today on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about a few forum topics, including Boomer Group, deadlift techniques, should you drop the weight, and hockey testing, some of the testing that he developed uh, when he was at BU. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. For the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better, Rob Milani joins us to talk about the current sale, some education, and the new Schwinn Airdyne, the 86 Pro. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Alan Cosgrove is on to talk about what can you offer in the fitness business that is exclusive and high priced. He uses a good example of Disney for that one. For the Functional Movement System segment, Brett Jones is on to start a two-part series on Indian clubs. Today he gives a whole history about them. All right, and on the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach segment, I have on Don Saladino. Don's the owner of Drive 495 and Drive 443. He's on to talk about his over 10 years as a facility owner, some of the changes he's made in his facility, hiring and keeping staff, opening a second facility, which he's, he just did recently, and his new internship slash mentorship program that they started. We're going to talk about that. That and much more coming up from Coach Saladino in a while. Also, I have a special segment on with Kevin Carr from Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. Kevin's going to talk about Coach Boyle's, all the different uh, mentorships and internships that they have there um, and uh, what differentiates them. So uh, lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I am doing Awesome. How's that? Awesome. For about my fifth, awesome. Uh, that's, that's a word that I use frequently. My fifth word, yeah. <laughs> um, Coach, things are going well. We've, uh, like we, we've been saying every, every show, the forums, we've really kind of, uh, uh, there's been a lot of action on the forum. It's been great. And uh, I think it's funny because sometimes the titles can be uh, deceiving. Uh, Corey Young uh, posted Boomer Group. And, and I, I didn't think, ah, it's probably not going to be a great one. It's a general pop question. But it was a really good discussion that you guys had. I'll just kind of give everybody a little bit of a background. He had asked if uh, MBSC or anyone else have examples of Boomer Generation fitness workouts who, in my case, score 0 to 5 on the FMS or have one or more artificial joints and are uh, overweight or in chronic pain. And um, he felt like, Fall prevention begins from the ground up, and you know you were kind of there. There were a lot of mention about DNS stuff, and and at the end of the day, I think, you know, you guys you were looking to build strength and mobility from up to down. I think this is obviously always a case of, you know, uh, of of it, it depends as well. But you know, you were saying you use the same thought process, but you work in reverse. You you do as much bilateral standing as possible to begin with, then you move down to a lunge, then to the half kneel. Um, you found that groundwork was really taxing, and you want success and confidence on their feet first. Uh, talk to us about this this post. Yeah, I thought, so what really happened, which is kind of cool, is that I, um, Corey had sent me that as a private message. I actually had encouraged, because Corey's a guy that I go back and forth with quite a bit, and I had asked him, and he was gracious enough to start to, you know, to join the site and to start to switch some stuff over to the um, to the site. You know, some of the conversations that we might have had on, um, you know, in kind of a more private setting. I said, you know, can you just pop that up as a forum question? So that was where it came from. And it's just interesting because he's, I think, kind of very into, you know, we were talking about into the DNS stuff, you know, into some stuff that maybe 
I'm not as into. And uh, so it was able to, to generate a really good, I guess, series of questions, series of thoughts, you know, in terms of, you know, his thing was he's doing a lot of stuff on the ground and, you know, get ups and like dead bug type stuff and a lot of the, the kind of basic DNS stuff. And my thought process was very different in terms of, I get the whole DNS thing and that when we were babies, you know, we did stuff on the ground and like, I always, you know, I, I remember going to the Colar class the first time I went and he was very good about showing developmental sequence. And this baby is three months old because this baby can do this. And this baby is 12 months old because this baby can do that. But I don't know necessarily if that is all that helpful when we're talking about older clients, you know, cause you know, he went back to like the four by four idea, but I feel like you need to get them back to the floor from where they are. And I, and I may end up being wrong on this at some point, someone may prove me wrong, but I think the transitions up and down from the floor are really, really difficult for your older client. And so my feeling is, okay, let's start with that, you know, with doing things in standing, get them, you know, out of the machines, get them out of chairs, get them to do some standing row and some standing press and, you know, maybe even some limited range bodyweight squat and, you know, and try to do some things so that eventually maybe we can go the reverse process, get them into like a split squat where they can stand up. And somebody, I forget it was, made a really good point of teaching like a Turkish get down, <laughs> which sounds like a dance, but um, <laughs> as opposed to a Turkish get up of teaching somebody yeah. kind of in reverse, like, okay, hold this over your head now, kneel down on one knee. And even like I look at it and think, hey, hold this in your hands and just get down on one knee and get up again that's going to be really big for somebody who's older. So it was, as you said, it was just a great exchange that I think probably helped a lot of people to, to yeah. kind of grasp some stuff. Yeah. And I think there, you know, there, like somebody had said on the thread, I forget who, like there is no right or wrong here because again, it has to, do, it has to depend on who we're talking about and what they can do. If they can get up from the ground already, that's a different story. Like if, if getting up and down and doing a get up or even a modified get up, Obviously, that's really important. I know I've said this story on here before, but I had one of my uh, 81-year-old ladies. She came in, and she had fallen down, and she, she couldn't get up. You know, we were talking about that uh, even on one newsletter. And the thing is, I kind of taught her how to get back up because that's just a strategy that she needed for, for life. And I agree with you that, you know, yeah, there are certain things. I mean, if you get uh, Gray Cook and Brett Jones to uh, get up DVD, they kind of do a million correctives, like where, wherever somebody is, um, deficient and, and they'll do that. So like you said, if they can't get up from one knee, they will have them kind of go down, maybe do some eccentric work, um, and, and kind of work on that position. So I don't, I don't think there's any right or wrong here. I, and you know, again, I, I try to get people up Anyway, and we do a lot of things standing up. That's what I love about the Kaisers is, you know, just even presses and rowing, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. I just think, like, what you had said, though, too, is really important. You know, I want success and confidence on their feet first. So that's important. Yeah, no, that's exactly. And I really think that when you're looking at that, that's exactly when I'm looking at that. That's what I want. I want people to to have the opportunity to feel like I like this. This is great. I you know. I think it, it's much like the kids when it goes back to the same idea in terms of testing, you know, you don't want to come in and be like, Oh yeah, you suck. Watch, you know, Jesus, I can really show you how much you suck. Watch, you know, you, you know, it's like some more stuff that you suck at, you know, I mean, people don't want that. They want to come in and, and be successful and progress. Yeah. So I think if I can get them to the ground, we showed, you know, a couple weeks ago or a month ago, we had that kind of elder get up idea that I put up that I've been showing people. If I can get to that and say, hey, here's a smooth way to get up from the ground and now you're strong enough. Because when we go back, like in my sort of basic mindset, we have this idea that you've got people who aren't strong enough to get up and down from the floor. They just don't have that unilateral strength. And a lot of them aren't strong enough bilaterally to squat down to something and stand up without trying, you know, without rocking and using some momentum. So when we start looking at that thinking, you know, we need to start a lot more basic and then work up. And I think that may be sometimes when we get into, I always talk about overthinking. I think we can overthink some of what we're doing and get into kind of DNS stuff and get ups and, 
and and be like, okay, this is, you know, in my mind anyway, and that's what I said in this thread, in my mind, I look at this and think it's got to be the other way around. All right. Um, it's funny because the next topic that I wanted to talk about was that deadlift technique eccentric phase. And it's, it's actually the same philosophy that you have. You said uh, people were talking about dropping the weight. And your philosophy is very simple. If you can't put it down, don't pick it up. So you're really saying the same thing. If you can't get down, don't try to get up. But talk to us about this, yeah. this idea about the deadlift and the eccentric phase and uh, how much work. And, and when, you know, is there, is that just a steadfast rule? Like, okay, you're not going to, if you can't put this down, you never let it. Obviously, if they're a power lifter, maybe, and they just have to get it up. And that's what they're training for. That's okay. Yeah, and I think it's the same idea when you know, you've got some of this um you know, some of this stuff with people where oh yeah, it's just a concentric manager, you don't want to get hurt lowering it down. But my you know, it goes back to like some of the McGill stuff and pulsing. There's a lot of stuff that you think about. If you can't lower it, you shouldn't raise it. Because in reality the injuries are probably gonna come in the eccentric portion of whatever it is that we're doing. And, you know, I think of that, you know, in deceleration, in landing, in stopping. That's where the injuries are. So I look at it and think, you know, if I can't clean a weight and catch it and bring it back down and clean it again, I don't necessarily want to clean it. And if I can't deadlift the weight up and lower it back down to where it's supposed to go, if I can't pick dumbbells up and get them back down on the floor, I don't know when we think about the idea of functional strength. I have a hard time looking at that and thinking, that that's going to be, in my mind, classified as functional strength. I would almost look at that and say it's dysfunctional strength because you have this concentric strength or concentric power that you can use, but you don't have the ability to reverse it. Not having the ability to reverse it is hugely problematic in my mind. So when I look at that, I think, hey, I definitely don't want to do that. And I'll even do that with people like we get some athletes sometimes, particularly some young kids who are pretty explosive. And they can clean, and they can't get the weight down again. And I make the coach, I tell them, lower the weight. Even though, they, even though they have that concentric force production capability, they don't have the eccentric ability yet to control that. So in my mind, the load is too heavy. And that's probably, I think, that some girls with ACLs, we have some girls who can get themselves going. And then suddenly they have to put the brakes on. Boom. Make a change direction, and they tear their ACL. And I think that's the same thing. You know, it's, it's no different when we go into the really simple analogies. It's developing this really great motor and then thinking, you know, I forgot to put some brakes in this car. I probably could use those. And then think, I want to do some city driving, but Jesus, I have no brakes. And I'm smashing into things all over the place and getting in car accidents. So mm. I think we've got to look at it that way and realize that the brakes are just as important as the accelerator. And it goes back, you know, I can, I can keep sort of analogizing or re-analogizing. I don't even know if those are words, but I doubt it. because we're so influenced by the track thing, like a track guy doesn't have to be able to slow down. He can take as long to stop after that race is over as he wants to. When he runs through the finish line and he says, I want to take a hundred steps more to slow down. No one cares. In a sporting setting, you are going to have to, you're going to, you know, somebody's going to change their position on the field, on the ice or whatever it is. And then you're going to have to change yours. Yeah. And so that really changes things very, very drastically. And I think that's why, again, we have to be wary sometimes that we're not simply blind slaves to, to sports or to to information that somebody gives us like, Oh yeah, this is the way to do it. You're like, well, I don't don't know if this is the way to do it necessarily. Yeah. You got to think about it. You got to think about it in a much bigger picture. I, it's interesting because I think, and again, this might be overthinking it, but there might even be a number. You might, we might come up and say, "Well, if you can lower double body weight, is that enough?" You know, I don't know. So if you can, if you, if I weigh two hundred pounds and I can deadlift four hundred and lower it, is it okay now to start going higher and just saying, "Okay, I'm going to drop it because maybe I'm in a danger zone and maybe I don't need." To have that kind of eccentric control, I don't know. I'm not. I'm, it's not something I've ever played with. Right, and yeah, and that's what I mean. I think the good thing, I think that's one of the coolest things about the forum, is it is literally a, a place where you are made to think. Yeah. Because someone may ask a question, and you think like there was a great one on the thread about um, other people's athletes and programming, and then somebody said, "Well, I have some athletes 
whose parents have asked me not to talk to their strength coach. Oh yeah. And I thought, Oh yeah. I never thought about that. That never even entered into my thought process when we're sort of evaluating, you know, you're reading through that thread and you're thinking about how you might approach some of these things. And then suddenly you realize, wow, th- you know, there's a whole kind of other variable there that I hadn't really considered. What was the reason for that though? Why didn't they want the, pa- why did the parents not? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't remember, yeah. but I just remember him saying that I had some parents tell me that they didn't want me to contact because, you know, maybe it's a question of, you know, they think the coach will be mad if they were, you know, yeah, because again, yeah. everybody does exactly. get, people get territorial. And yep. so, you know, you realize like, oh, wow, there's, there's more in general sometimes going on. And the other one, uh, it was actually in that same thread, other people's athletes, Adam Matters had talked about wanting his athletes to, to run more in the off season to build up training load because he trains field hockey players. And I started thinking, you know, that's kind of a unique situation because obviously this field hockey girl is going to get to school and might have to go through, you know, two, two hour practices a day. And if she hasn't done some, even some jogging, something to build up some training load, she might get hurt in, in preseason. Yeah. Whereas I would look at ice hockey and think, you know, my daughter's skating five or six hours a week right now with you know the various skill stuff that she's doing, I'm not worried about her training load. I'm actually worried about decreasing her training load during the workouts. So it's um it's just a pretty interesting process when you start to to realize that you can be very clouded by your own lens. Yep. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's funny because you say that the kid that rents for me works with a high school and the the football coach just, you know, basically blows them off. And I actually found out from two other guys that are working with other athletes that go there that he said the same thing. He's saying the same things about both strength coaches in different situations. The kid that rents for me and my other friends, they didn't know each other. And then we were talking and then it just turned out that, oh, wow, yeah, oh, yeah. And that's what he says. So I think you're right. The parents probably say, this guy's a maniac. He's just going to give my kids a hard time if they're training somewhere else. So, you know, hopefully they get a packet so you can understand what they're required at least and you can kind of modify it, like you said, because you don't know what their, what their schedule is going to look like. You're going to have to make sure they're prepared for that season. Right, exactly. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's really interesting when you, you realize that, as I said, I think there's always kind of more going on than you think there is going on. Yep. And I think we've probably said that a million times. <laughs> yep. Coach, uh, you, one thread uh, was on pro hockey testing, and you said you do three on-ice tests with your national team. Uh, the uh, goal to blue line sprint, the blue to goal line shuttle, and then the change of direction. Could you just kind of uh, give us an overview of these three? Yeah, so we do a change of uh, we do a sprint test. You know, our equivalent, probably the honest equivalent to the ten and the twenty yard dash, is goal line and blue line. And we developed some simple thoughts, and it, it's amazing how again we talk about how everything works out, but it ends up being twenty yards because it's about sixty feet. But the one thing you realize is that the offensive zones are the only thing that's consistent rank to rank. One of the unique things about hockey is that the ranks mentioned do not, does not have to be the same. So you've got smaller neutral zones and bigger neutral zones, bigger areas behind the net, and smaller areas behind the net. But the consistent sizing is offensive zone. So we did everything using the offensive zone, and we did our change direction based off circle. So that, again, consistent sizing. So that anybody can take it. You know, one of the things when you're developing tests, you want this whole idea of validity and reliability the test to be valid in the sense that we want it to measure, you know, obviously if you say sprint from goal to blue line, it's a pretty valid test. It's going to measure speed. If we look at who's first and who's last, we'll be able to say who the fastest is and who the slowest is. And then reliability wise, I could share my data with you and say, this is what my girls did goal line and blue line. You could go do a test set of girls in New York and you could compare data with me. And so we end up in a really good situation there. So that we use the same distance for our, our basically, we took a three equivalent of the three yard shuttle. And when I first started doing it with my BU guys, all I did was look at how long it took us and said, okay, what I knew the 300 yard shuttle tended, the times tended to be 
in between 50 and 60 seconds for my our athletes. So I said, okay, what number of goal line to blue line shuttles falls into that same number? It was seven. So we said, okay, we're going to do goal to blue. See, look, why'd you pick seven? I'm like, because that gets you into that minute area. The interesting thing is now you've got this, I think it's, it's 20, so it's 60 feet, right? So it's, uh, I guess it's 120 feet per time. So 700, it's like, yeah, 840 feet, right? And then you look at what's the 300 yard shuttle. Well, it's 900 feet. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Yeah. So not knowing that, not knowing that these things in the times are going to come out the same. And actually, if you, we tested our guys, drop offs were about the same times were about the same running to skating. So they had ended up being very valid, very reliable, very predictive, very um, indicative of what their off ice fitness was. And we just literally use the construct of that original 300 yard shuttle test. People say, why did you use five minutes? You know, hockey's more of a three to one sport. And I'm like, cause when the 300 yard shuttle run test was devised, they used five minutes. I didn't make up the original test. I simply copied it and made it into a hockey test. Same way with the five ten five, we did the same thing in the circle, right to the outside edge of the circle, across the center of the circle to the left side, back to the middle. Same idea. So we were able to get all of this, a lot of very similar data, and then give people tests that they could then go do anywhere and be able to have data that they could compare to ours and look and say, okay, now I know what fast is. If someone said, what's well conditioned, I would say to somebody, okay, if they average under 60, on that shuttle test and they have a differential of less than three, they're in good shape. And someone would look and go, okay, I did that with my girls and this is what the scores were. Okay. So, you made those up? I made it all up. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm just wondering if there's any other data out there. So really it's just your data. No, uh, because and it was just a matter of, I think using my common sense brain and saying, okay, what are we doing off the ice? How can we do something similar on the ice? And that's what we came up with. But a lot of people are doing it now. It's becoming yeah. more and more common. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Just because I think it does make sense. Coach, are you, uh, one last thing, are you reading? What are you reading right now? Or what's the last book you read? Um, what am I reading right now? I actually have read three spy novels in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Jack Reacher one, uh, Brad Thor. <laughs> but Just, I'm on my, uh, I'm not going to read professionally kick, but I think I talked about uh, Lessons from the Mouse I've been playing around with. And then Lee, um, Lee Cockle wrote another one called The Customer Rules, which is kind of a nice sort of double entendre because it's like the customer rules and then it's like the customer rules. So you've got these two yeah. thoughts. You know, the customer rules, the the thought process, they're in charge, and then you've got the, the rules for customers. So I'm actually playing around with a lot of customer service stuff in addition. Nice. And there seems to be a lot of uh, a lot of books right now that like had nothing to do. Like I'm in touch with James Kerr, who wrote Legacy, so he's going to be on the show soon. Oh, nice. Yeah, and you know, I think he was just kind of surprised. I told him, you know, look, I know I'm a little late to the party, but at at the same time, you probably don't realize the impact it's had on the strength and conditioning community. Um, and then another one is uh, Angela Duckworth's Grit. So uh, I have Grit. Actually, I started Grit, too. I have about six books that I've started. Yeah, sure. Grit is one of them that I got. And I actually have ordered um, – I, I, have, I have so many books sitting around, and all of a sudden I get into this, like, recreational reading gig. Yeah. No, no, you do. You got to go Every, back and forth. Once I just, a year I do – yeah, once in a year I, I do it. Like, once a year, like, in the summer when I know I'm going to be sitting outside. Because I, I don't know if you're the same as me, but sometimes it's work. To get through ten or twenty pages a night of a professional book like Grit, yeah, Grit doesn't grab me like the story. You know what I mean? If I'm looking at my, you know, my my book right now, the other one actually, I started reading Seven Keys to Being a Great Coach to Alistair. Oh, Alistair, yeah, I got that. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna do and a. So I've actually, I've, yeah, he's, he's gonna, gonna do, do a segment on the show. Like he's gonna do, like so he's gonna have. We're gonna have seven segments with Alistair on each. Uh, like five minute segments, so he's going to come on the show. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm up to page sixty two in his book, and I like that. I, I, he's got a lot of great stuff in there. Yeah, he's he's awesome. Um, also, um, Boys in the Boat. Have you read that? I haven't. Oh my god! But you is it? Read that. What? 
Okay, because you're, you're not the first person who said that. Oh, so man, I, I I'm guess telling you. It took me back. two years. My clients have been trying to tell me. It's uh, on the, the guys from uh, Washington University uh, in, the, in the Depression era about... You know about it's a true story about that their quest for Olympic gold in 1936. So you get a great history lesson between American Depression era and then the Nazi Germany, like them coming into what they eventually led led up to, and then uh, this this great story about rowing and tr- and their training and and un really unbelievable. Like the guy, the way he wrote it, he does a great job. Because I'm not really a big history buff, but he really did a great job of kind of going back and forth and making you kind of want to hear about the Nazi Germany and want to hear about certain things that were going on in depression. So he did an amazing, amazing book. Um, so highly, highly recommended. Awesome. All right, Coach. All right, we'll, hey, I'm going to uh, get then, back to work there, but I appreciate it. Yep, yeah, we'll talk to you next time. All right, thanks. I'll see you. All right, now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better. And I'm here with the lovely and te- – wait a minute. It's not Aaron. Rob Milani. <laughs> Rob, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> and don't ever give me an intro like that one again. All right, I'm going to give you one more chance. You called me lovely again, and uh, I'm out the door. Right. <laughs> um, Rob, what's happening, buddy? Oh, Can you just start us uh, to get the uh, the current sale? What's going on? All right, so right now we have our online sale going on. It's the Buy More, Save More. So uh, orders 50 to $99, you're going to save 10% on there. Uh, 100 to 149 is going to be 15%. And above uh, $150, you'll save 20% on there. So a lot of good stuff going online right now. Nice, very cool. And let's talk about a product. Um, you know, there's been – the Schwinn Aerodyne is a really popular – uh, a product in, in our, in our world. And, uh, you know, for the, the bike, um, coach Boyle really talks about it a lot for, for years, but then it, I don't know if quality was kind of lacking or what happened. There's a couple other bikes that came around and people started to use those, but you're saying that Schwinn has a new, uh, a new bike out. Tell us about it. Yeah. And just like you were saying, the, uh, the bikes originally from Schwinn were more considered a consumer bike, but coach Boyle, Loved the, the programming to put behind that. So he kind of made the bike somewhat iconic uh, in that world and, and going through interval training, long distance stuff. Um, they just weren't able to handle the abuse being put on them, especially from our collegiate people going to our professional. Uh, they broke down pretty quick. So that there's been other people move into that market segment. We have the Assault bike, which we love. Um, we've been supporting that now for about two years. And Mike really got us into that bike when Schwinn fell apart and they came out with their, their last bike. So the assault bike's been fantastic for us, but uh, again, Mike wanting to see what else was out there on the uh, market for air bikes, got the 86 pro, which is their new entry level back into it. They finally took a bike and made it commercial grade. So we've had one here at the office for about eight months. I've been logging, you know, 10 to 20 miles a day on it myself. Um, really cool bike. It seems to be handling it very well. We just put 35 of them up at uh, Boston university last week. Those guys love them. They've been demoing it for about six months, but you know, some of the features on there that are a little bit unique to the bike, the screen is massive on there. So you're getting RPMs, calories per second, heart rate, uh, the ability to filter through. Timing uh, goes a little bit further than what the Assault bike does. That's been one of our major knocks on that is it doesn't get to the uh, the individual seconds. So you get 10, 20, 30. Uh, same thing on the mileage, 10, 20. This does give you that second window on there. So, so far, so good. We've been demoing it. We have a bunch in the field. Um, feedback's been awesome. So... Something we're going to see in our catalog here coming up. It's online already right now. Uh, we're looking forward to a great year with it. Very cool. So you've been using it for about eight months now, you said, and then you guys put some in BU. So, uh, and it's been, really, it's been holding up pretty well? Yeah, we've had zero issues with it so far. I don't want to say anything is going yeah, to be bulletproof. But, uh, you know, as far as a air bike right now, those have been our two least maintenance bikes. Um, it's kind of cool too. It's got some different handle grips on there. So you have an upper lower and a prone on there. So someone six, four, like myself, it's a little bit nicer to get a higher handhold on there. So, uh, it's been really nice, really smooth bike. Uh, we're kind of crossing our fingers a little bit, but we've done a, a lot of testing before we offered it to customers. So like I said, Glenn and Mike have had them up there, both logged a lot of miles and, uh, it's been really good. Very cool. Very cool. Now, Another question about this thing, Erin McGurr talks a lot of crap about you sometimes and about her ability to beat you in the gym in a lot of different events. Uh, can, can, she, can she maybe, like, are, is she comparable to you on, the, uh, on this new Schwinn? 
<laughs> Anthony, I would love to say, can we post something uh, on strengthcoach.com? Um, we might do a video of the showing, week. Uh, showing our times. Can we can we take pictures of our time, our, our total mileage? We can definitely do that. This week for a 10-minute a ride. <laughs> Absolutely. And we'll see what we come out with. All right. Maybe, uh, you know, it's a good segue into our Providence Summit coming up in a couple of weeks where maybe we can have a little bit of a spinoff between you two. But uh, just give us some details about the Providence Summit coming up. No, absolutely. We just uh, eventually we had our Orlando summer first time last uh, this year was our first kickoff to that about a month ago. We just had Chicago last weekend and uh, province is rolling around the corner here, July 14th through the 17th. So anyone that hasn't been to one of our summits, uh, definitely take a look at it on the website. You'll see what we feel is the best lineup of presenters from around the country. We cover all sorts of segments from business, uh, individual training, personal training. Um, we have sport coaches in there. So Unbelievable lineup. We're expecting about 1,100 people in there. We'll have different vendors in there. We'll be showing a lot of different product in there, too. So we're really looking forward to that. Very cool. And I will tell everybody that I just tried to get a hotel. And the hotels are booking up. So it's obvious that uh, it's a busy time. You guys usually sell this one out pretty quickly. Uh, it's a popular one. So, uh, so get on there. Rob, thanks so much for coming on today. Anytime, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Hello and welcome to the Functional Movement Systems segment. My name is Brett Jones. Today I would like to talk about Indian clubs. Uh, I've been very fortunate over the last uh, several years to work with Dr. Ed Thomas, uh, really somebody that would have to be considered the leading uh, Indian club expert, um, at least uh, in the States, and um, something that I've been very happy to add to my not only training that I do for myself, but that I do for my clients. Uh, we got together with Dr. Thomas and that resulted in the product Club Swinging Essentials, where we lay out a little bit of the history, um, a, a little bit of uh, the uh, how-tos of the basic Indian club movements. And uh, that's been, been well received and something that we uh, would like to incorporate more into the general training field. Uh, Indian clubs are Indian clubs are fascinating. Uh, they have an extremely long history. Uh, if you go back through the, the Vedic traditions, uh, Hindu Vedic traditions, um, it is a 5,000 plus year history. When you look at the Vedic gods when they're pictured, they're pictured with an Indian club. Uh, they were considered a gift from divinity. Um, so they've been used uh, for an extremely long time. And it's not too much of a mental leap to think that some of the first tools and weapons would have been very club-like in their origin. Uh, there's an argument that uh, you know the a femur bone may have been one of the first tools or weapons used in a very club-like um, weapon that it is. And it, it existed within those traditions for quite some time. Um, you know, various traditions have used the bow staff or a club of some sort um, as both a, a weapon and a training tool. We're obviously going to be focusing on the training tool uh, aspect of Indian clubs. Uh, for our purposes, uh, the British brought clubs back with them from India. In fact, the British Marines physical training instructor, the nickname for those um, is still the clubs. So the patch, British Marines physical training instructor patch is an uh, arm holding a club in and in it's multiple arms in a big circle holding clubs. And uh, so their physical training instructors are still known as the clubs. So it has a very, a very deep history. Um, Indian clubs are thought to have come to the United States um, around uh, the 1860s, and there's a little bit of conflicting information there. Uh, there's a gentleman known as uh, Aaron Molino Hewitt, who was the head of the Harvard Gym um, uh, in the, the mid-1800s, and he was an African-American male um, who was head of the gym uh, in Harvard. Um, really interesting that uh, African-American male was head of the Harvard gym, uh, certainly the antebellum times, uh, the, the culture of the day in the U.S. was not the um, uh, best um, at that time, and, and, but he came to uh, be in charge of the 
the Harvard gym. And um, there's pictures of him. In fact, I saw one of them in an Indian club table book. Uh, yes, they actually have table books on Indian clubs. Um, and they had him as an unidentified African-American male with his Indian clubs. Um, it's actually Aaron Molina Hewitt. Um, and uh, he's pictured with Indian clubs, a medicine ball, a staff, a bow staff, uh, boxing gloves, and dumbbells. Uh, these were the tools of his trade. In fact, boxing historian and author Kevin R. Smith states, from rough and tumble bouts in vacant lots on the austere surroundings of New York's theaters and exhibition halls to the hallowed and cultured settings of Harvard University, Aaron Molino Hewitt was a unique, powerful, and talented man. For a black man to move through and flourish in the mid-19th century America, as Hewlett certainly had, was an amazing achievement and one to be studied with amazement. So it's excellent that we're learning more and more about uh, Aaron Molino Hewitt and uh, his time not only as a boxer but also at the Harvard gym. Uh, when he's pictured with the wand, the clubs, the dumbbell, the medicine ball, uh, those were actually known at the time as the four horsemen of handheld exercise equipment. And uh, I love the prose and the writing of the day, uh, the four horsemen of handheld exercise equipment, uh, from the austere surroundings of New York's theaters, exhibition halls, to the hallowed and cultured settings of Harvard University. Um, we don't talk like that anymore. It's kind of a shame. But anyway, um, the four horsemen of handheld exercise equipment were part of this concept um, of having martial tools, tools that taught us how to respond appropriately to aggression, uh, certainly for the four horsemen uh, of handheld exercise equipment, both clubs and wands could have been used for martial purposes. Uh, there were tools of restorative nature uh, that helped bring the body back to center, help balance things out. Um, any of those tools could be used within a, a restorative uh, setting. And then there were pedagogical uh, or a theoretical body of knowledge of how to use these tools, how to accomplish your goals. Um, so there's a lot of history uh, just, just within that, um, just as far as Indian clubs are concerned. So uh, traditionally, Sim Kehoe is thought to have brought clubs to the U.S. in the 1860s. However, uh, Aaron Molino Hewitt and the Turnverein or the Turners who came to America around 1848, uh, they predate Sim Kehoe and they both were using uh, Indian clubs or meals of some sort. Um, so there's some conflicting information on the history and everything. Sim Kehoe was um, a, a, one of the first uh, mail order marketers of his day. Uh, he was actually selling clubs and had instructional books and pamphlets out. Um, with it. So just kind of wrapping that into a little box there um, within the Indian um, tradition dating back 5,000 plus years uh, via Friedrich Jan and the Turnverein method uh, which came kind of came to be in the German uh, era uh, 1806 to 1811. By 1848 the Turnverein, the Turners came to America. Uh, they established Turner Halls all over the country, particularly the Midwest. In fact, Dr. Thomas started swinging Indian clubs at the age of eight at a Turner Hall in Davenport, Iowa. And then fast forward into Dr. Thomas's life where he ends up studying with uh, club swinging teachers in Burma uh, in 1988. Uh, he also studied with club swinging teachers in Korea and Czechoslovakia. The Skulls uh, is a similar – that would be similar to the Turnverein or the Turner method coming out of the German uh, traditions. The Skulls uh, were a, uh, a group within the Czechoslovakian traditions. And then I studied with Dr. Thomas. And uh, I've been working on my Indian club swinging. And uh, in the next podcast, look forward to talking about – uh, how we apply the clubs in a modern day training fashion. Thanks for listening and look forward to uh, being with you on the Strength Coach Podcast next time. Hey guys, this is the Results Fitness University sponsored section of the Strength Coach Podcast, the business of fitness. Today is, I'm going to talk about, uh, this is Alan Cosgrove, by the way, if you didn't recognize my sexy Scottish accent, it's me. 
Today I'm going to talk about really a, a concept uh, more than a lesson. I had a, a friend visiting just this uh, week and he he stayed with us on, on Monday evening. On Tuesday morning, we had to go to the Disney store for it to open at 10 a.m. because there was a new toy getting released and he was going to buy it for his daughter. He, he's from the UK and I think this particular toy wasn't coming out in the UK. Anyway, I drive him down there at 10 in the morning and there is a line outside the store, right? Like like the lines when Apple launched a new iPhone, right? It was adults lining up for their kids. So we ended up going in and it's a, something called a, a Tsum, T-S-U-M. I don't even know how to pronounce it. And it's from the movie Finding Dory. So my friend stands in line. We're outside waiting to get in about 30 minutes. When we get in, he joins the line. And there's four staff just behind the counter with buckets of this little toy. It's six bucks each. I think there's eight of them get released. It's a limited edition toy. And if you, I'm guessing they always sell out. So the concept is what can we offer in the fitness business that's exclusive and high priced? Because Disney has created raving fans of this, right? That honestly, the price is irrelevant to these these customers. They want to get this before it runs out. It's an exclusive to toy that you can only get. It's the first Tuesday of the month these toys come out and there's a whole collection. So they create raving fans. Similar to how Apple do it when the new phone comes out, people are standing it overnight just to be the first they can get it. This Disney one's taking it to another level. It's not just about being first. They'll run out of this, right? And it's similar to how you know, you'll see subscriptions for Sports Illustrated that if you buy now, you will get a free football phone. Now, apparently when Sports Illustrated ever do these promotions where you get a free football phone or, you know, something like that, subscriptions go way up because people want the phone. They can get Sports Illustrated anytime they want, but they can't get the phone unless they call right now or, or do the online offer or something like that. So it's the exclusive offer even though the product, the rest of the product is available all the time, that exclusive short-term offer is what drives the business. So the lesson in this episode is how can you create a culture of raving fans that no matter what product you're offering, you're so good at offering good product and services that people want more of what you have to, to, to give. So the concept I want you to get is no matter what your highest price membership is at your gym, your highest price services, there's a group of people who are ready to give you more money for an exclusive membership or some type of short-term offer, something high priced. So again, today it's more of a concept I want you to think of. Uh, a good example we used at the gym is we did a high priced six-week program. It's an intensive six-week program that we offered for an additional $1,000. This was over and above the membership prices, and we really did it to attract new members, but our existing members were so excited to do it, they took one of the limited spots with limited availability, so they essentially stood in line so they could get one of these spots, and these were already paying customers. So the lesson is, what can you offer that's exclusive or a premium product that you can give to your existing members, right? These are not the people lining up for the... the uh, iPhone are already existing Apple customers. The people lining up outside Disney are already existing Disney customers. And the people getting Sports Illustrated are pretty sure they've already got read a copy of Sports Illustrated. They're already customers. They're doing something premium. So premium services is this month's, uh, this episode's lesson. My name is Alan Cosgrove. If you have any follow-up questions, you can put them on my Facebook page. You can check us out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Or you can check us out at the uh, business section, the business forum, www.strengthcoach.com. So I look forward to talking to you guys there, and we'll see you next time. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach, and today I have on Donnie Saladino from Drive 495. Donnie, thanks for coming on today. Anthony, man, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure, brother. All right. Well, if anybody's ever watched Strength Coach TV, they know um, that um, I was at Drive 495. We did a whole tour. We had a nice conversation about some of the business. And, um, 
you know, since then, you've opened up, uh, you've expanded, you've opened up a second location in New York City, and you've actually changed the, the space around. You took um, some of your um, golf bays out, so I want to talk about that a little bit. So let's let's go there sure. first. Let's talk about Drive 495 first, and, and okay. you, you, you changed around a little bit because, you know, businesses change. You've been doing this since, when did you guys open, 2007? 2005, six. Okay. Like right in between there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's been a while. We were going on 11 years now. So, uh, <laughs> getting old, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have, you know, you've, you've kind of been, you know, you've, you've gone through a bunch of different changes. So like, for example, first, probably I would assume because your brother, Donnie, uh, your brother, Joey is, um, one of, I, you know, one of the best amateurs, amateur golfers in this, certainly the Mets section, he's gone sure. on to do some national stuff. So you guys are like this great combination of, you know, super trainer and super golfer and you guys open drive 495. And I'm assuming originally it was mo- like, you had what? In the beginning, you had like six bays uh, hitting. Yeah. Bays. That's a lot of real estate for just the bays. Well, you know, it, it went back and forth. It's funny how you mentioned, because when we opened, actually, you've been in here. The first floor was all gym. And the second floor was only golf. And then what we did was on the first floor, we added two bays because there was such a demand for the golf. And then as time went on, we realized that we just needed more open room. And we said, you know what? I, it, you know, you fall into that trap. It's like, how much space do you need and how much space do you want? And it's the biggest conversation I get on with a lot of these coaches who want to be entrepreneurial and they want to go into their own business. Yeah, of course, 30,000 feet would have worked better than 15, but where am I going to be able to survive? So I think it was just kind of finding out because we were a new concept. What do we actually need opposed to what do we want? And then with, you know, so we went a gym to more golf back to more fitness and you know functional space and right now that's that was that's a sweet spot at 495 yeah it's so true i like that i'm so glad you said the want and the need part because mm-hmm. you know we do we we see equipment that we really want but do we need it you know we want we always want all this space but do we really need it in the beginning i think people always start out thinking yeah we're going to have so many people we don't have those people yet so you know uh, so you got to take it easy, but so talk to me about, uh, what went into that decision just to take the bays out. Did you feel like, look, we're, it's, it is a lot of real estate, two bays is a lot of, those things are huge. Those things are huge. I mean, if you think about it, it's 22 by 16. So it's 22 by 16. So we put that downstairs and then there's a little walkway and there's a little putting area. So we roughly had, you know, I don't know, anywhere from 14 to 1700 feet where you can only really fit three, four people. I mean, that's, you know, in soul cycle terms, they're doing a class of, you know, 60, 70 people in that. It's insane. So you've got to really just, and there's other concepts in the city that go into the business and they go into the golf business. And I got to be honest, it just doesn't, it's not lucrative enough to just go so heavily on that golf. We know because we've been doing it longer than anyone in the city that, yeah, you could put in, you know, put golf's an amenity to drive, you know, where in the beginning, we were under the assumption that, yes, we're going to bring it in. It's going to be this huge draw. And it was. It still is a huge draw. But you don't need to go tie up, you know, three, 4,000 feet on golf bays. I mean, the reality is, is you'll make some money, but nowhere near what you're going to make by pumping out the fitness. Absolutely. Yeah. I know that here at Five Iron, you know, obviously I'm in the basement, so my rent is much cheaper. But, sure. you know, also I don't always rely on – my facility only because I have the podcast and traincoach.com. And so for me, yep. it was never something like I don't do a lot of marketing or um, right. I don't really pursue a lot of new clients, to be honest with you. But I know what you're saying. I mean, it's a tough – like after you've after you've kind of gone af- after all the golf pros, where do yeah. you go after that? So it is – marketing can be tough. Yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, again, it's, it's all right, I'm going to have one golf lesson going on or I'm going to have, you know, in that same space, I could potentially have three coaches training 12 people, you know, if it's a semi-private model. I, and it's, you know, a, again, the golf, a huge part of our business. We'll never take it out of 495. It's a driving force here, but it's a destination spot in the city. It's not something where at our other location we felt like we needed it in there. Absolutely. Don, talk about, because you've kind of run the gamut too with like different uh, um, different uh, situations with staff. I'm not sure if you ever had subcontractors, but talk to me about like 
what you did with for employees and staff and pay in the beginning? Because it's a big question we get on Strength Coach, whether, you know, subcontracting or how do we employ employees or how do we find good employees? Talk to us about, you know, what, how you worked your employees in the beginning and how it's evolved. Because you have a great staff, too, by the way. Um, and, um, Thank you. And, uh, you know, where, uh, where, where, how, just give us a little bit of a, a, a talk on that journey. Cool. Um, so yeah, in the beginning, we really started with independent contractors. Um, we still have some independent contractors. Um, but you know, in time, I feel like year by year, we're, we're just, we're assigning more coaches to uh, salary base. No, it's interesting. I mean, there's a misconception out there on what these coaches are making per hour. You know, I met with um, a trainer the other day from a big box gym. I can't mention the name. And he basically, I asked him, I said, listen, we're having this discussion. I got to ask some personal questions. What are you making an hour? And he says, you know, I'm making as a level, whatever, I'm making, you know, 63 an hour. I, I forget the exact number. It's irrelevant. I said, well, how many hours are you working for that? He goes, 25 plus I have to donate 10 to 15 hours hours a week to them. I go, what are you making for that? He goes, nothing. I said, so you're not making $62, $63 an hour. And he kind of looked at me. I says, you're making, and I did the math, you're making $40, $45 an hour. So I I think what happens at a lot of these these, uh, big box clubs is that there's this opportunity loss where they're going in and they have to put in some time for these clubs. They're required to do screenings, assessments. They're uh, required to do floor hours. And they're not considering that as part of their pay. And it's almost, you know, it's almost steering. And it's it's funny because it's like three or four coaches have met with me, you know, since my um, talk in um, Chicago for Perform Better, I've had, you know, several coaches come in here just for asking me for some business direction. And each one of them were completely off, you know, they were way off on what, they didn't even know what they were making an hour. So, yeah. So what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to get these these men and women back to you know more of a salary based position. Um, I'm trying to get it to where I'm controlling their schedule a little bit more, where they're not in here, you know, four hours in the morning, getting a workout in, hanging around, doing emails all afternoon, and then staying three four hours a night, where they're basically wasting an entire day. I'm trying to control it a little more, where I'm saying, all right, listen, come in, give me six to eight hours straight. We're gonna pump people to you. Yes, we're gonna own your schedule, but then you're at least gonna have a life and you're gonna have an afternoon. And I think you know when all said and done. Um, they could do a lot more with themselves. They have a lot more time to do the things that I'm going to be discussing at Perform Better Rhode Island. You know, that's the combination of bringing you know fitness and business together. And I'm going to be talking about how you know whether you're any type of health fitness practitioner, you're going to be able to scale. So those are some of the points that I'm going through, which I like to call my Ten Commandments, which is going to be a great talk. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, again, the business is evolving. Uh, um, you know, going. Forward, from that independent contractor role to more of that salary based position is something that we're really pushing hard for. Awesome. Donnie, how do you keep your staff? I know, look, you are, I hate to call you a celebrity trainer because that's, I, it's an annoying term, but, um, yeah. but you truly are one. I mean, you do, you train celebrities. That's yeah. the bottom line. Sure. Um, sure. It, so too many people use that term a little loosely. Um, but, but um, you train a lot of celebrities, and I know, like, it's kind of like with, you know, if you work at MBSC, you have a good chance eventually of ending up at a college. If you train at uh, Drive 495, there might be a chance that you're going to work with a celebrity. You might even travel with them. Like, you know, we don't want to sure. go into who's doing that. But, um, right. but you know, what are the opportunities for you? Like, as you've grown now, you have the other location. Um what are like? How do we keep people? How do how do you keep people? I know you know you guys have d- trying to do some continuing education. You have Charlie Weingroff with you, uh, yep. Chris Weikus. Um, uh, talk to us about how you're trying to keep people and how you're trying to educate your staff. You know, I, I think it really comes down to stimulating them. You know, I, I, almost everyone I've met in this industry, you know, they come into it because they have a love, they have a thirst for wanting to learn more and wanting to improve and wanting to go in the right direction. So we're really in a position right now where we're able to give a lot of opportunity to these coaches. Chris, for instance, I, I got to be honest, Chris came to me two and a half years ago for a job and you know, it, it was interview after interview after interview. I just wasn't ready to hire him. And when I brought him aboard, I said, Chris, listen, I really don't have much room for you. I'm going to bring you in and um, let's see where it goes. He's, he's my director of education now. He started my mentorship program. He is going to be a long-term plan. John O'Neill, another coach, I think he used to work for Cressy. Um, used to work for Mike Ranfone. Um, Mike called me and said, you got to hire this kid. I brought him in, really impressed me from a, from a work standpoint. He's now handling our, um, you know, he's helping us build an online site, which is going to be about, you know, 
I'm getting so much uh, uh, de- demand for, for online programs now that we're going to do something for our existing membership and our non-members and we're going to be able to scale that. So John is a great numbers guy. John's helping lead that. So I think the beautiful thing is, is guys who come in here, not only are they learning under some, uh, you know, some incredible leadership from a, not only a training standpoint, but we're grooming these guys for business, guys and girls for business. And, um, there's opportunity. I, I, I don't, you know, do I play favoritism at, at the club? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, if you come in, I don't care if a guy's been here six, seven years. If you come in and you wow me and you bring a, uh, an idea to the table that I think is scalable, fortunately, my brother and I, you know, we're in the situation where we have the means to be able to now financially scale that scale that process. So um, I, I think that's a really attractive thing for the coaches here. I think they're looking at it as, wow, you know what? We're we're on a great team. We're on a great team that's really growing. It's starting to go pretty fast. There's, there's different avenues coming from all these different directions and this might be a great opportunity for me to segue from coaching, which is something I love, into something bigger and greater. Yeah, great point. And Coach Boyle um, has done a great job with his staff, like for example, kind of giving piece of the pie to – uh, Kevin Carr and Brandon yeah. Rick and, and, you know, and Kevin Larrabee and Marco, you know, all these guys have, you know, they're, they play a part in some side business, like the certified functional strength coach and, and, um, and a couple of other things, you know, body by boil online, stuff like that, sure. um, where he's kind of partnered with them as well. So it, it's, it's great that, uh, you're kind of headed in that same direction. And, you know, that's a good segue into your other location because now there's other locations. Eventually you're going to want to maybe put your own management in there. I don't know how you're doing that right now, but let's talk about it's that. It's happening now. Okay. Yeah, hey, no, you're, you're absolutely right. It's happening now. I think that's what the coaches are seeing. And I think that's one of the things that that's attracting them. I, you know, listen, my, our, our business model has been really simple when it comes down to our staff. You know, it, it, it's we want them to come in here. We want them to be great people. First off, like you've got to hire, like give a certification and just being a great person, someone that you just want to spend time with. And then obviously, yeah, there's that continuing education side. There's that thirst and that there's that hunger to get better. But right now, you know, we already with our with our with our two new men, um, interns that we brought in. It's just—it's almost a bad word for it because these are these are coaches. One of them, you know, has a ton of experience, managed a big box club. Another one is a little bit more new to the business, but still understands. And we're already positioning them over at the new club where they're helping us implement a lot of the four nine five programs over to the four four three. And it's a great example, and it's an opportunity for them to build a business. They're helping us build a business. We're going through you know numbers with them. We're showing them. All right, this is where we were last week. This is where we are this week. This is what we have to think about. How are we going to improve these numbers? What's an element that the club's missing? It's a really unique situation um, that we're putting a lot of these coaches in. So, you know, I know that when you go to the site and you read about it and you see internship, mentorship, and, you know, recently we had a coach call us and like, well, I have a year and a half of experience. Like, sure, you have a year and a half of experience coaching. You don't have a year and a half experience coaching under our umbrella, and you sure as hell aren't going to uh, aren't learning anything that we want to teach you, which is basically the stuff that you want to learn that you're not learning anywhere else. So, um, you know, yeah, call it mentorship program, internship program, but it really, truly is an experience, and it's it's an opportunity for us to do hires. So, yeah, I can tell you right now, these two guys that I have in there uh, here, one of them we've already put onto a part time hire, so he's already, you know. Half hours mentor, uh, uh, going through the mentorship program, and the other half, he's he's an employee now. So um, it's a great opportunity. It really is. Yeah, that's funny because I know Exos or Athletes Performance, formerly, uh, you know, Boyles, the uh, Cressies, they've all kind of had guys in there through their program that they've ended up hiring. So good stuff. Donnie, tell us a little bit before, let's go back. Well, you know what? We're going to come back to the internship. Let's go to 443. Um, what, how did you decide to like sure. either buy, you know, like, Instead of opening uh, an ex- you know your own place and having the 495 specific stamp on it and design, you went in, you bought a place that was um, or you took over a place that was existing already. Talk to us about that decision and that process. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, again, it's you know sometimes you have to jump on opportunity. I mean, it, it was something where Joe and I for a long time we wanted to open another place, and we've been saying we're going to do it, but you know, unfortunately, you know, things in 07, 08, and you know, financing and taking turns, and then a lot of positive stuff starts happening. You know, my brother and I being pulled away from you know to from the day to day to really go after some internet stuff that's that's all tied into here, but some other opportunities that would take precedent over opening another club. Um, 443 kind of fell on our lap in the last few months where it was an existing owner that we knew that we really liked. 
he had a he had a successful club. Um, he did a good job with it. I mean, he'll flat out admit that you know it, it, to take it to the next level, he needed guys like us to come in and run with it. So you know, he was getting married. You know, he got married, was having a baby, had a new job offer, something that he couldn't turn down, and we ran into it. And it was you know, it was something that wow, like it, you are you do not have time to plan for this. Sometimes things get thrown in your face, and you're like, okay, it is. We just got to run and we got to go with this. So, our, you know, our main priority was looking through the PLs, looking through his tax returns over the last several years, making sure everything matched up, which it did. And then when you come into a place, it had a great culture. Um, so you don't want to disrupt the culture. I know the first thing was the membership was just freaked out. You know, they're like, oh my God, we're looking at 495. It's this high end exclusive. Like the price is going to go up. Are we going to get punched out of here? Are the coach is going to get fired. What's going on? And I turned around, and my brother and I just said, listen, we're going to come in there. We're going to put uh, we're going to put an improvement to the space: paint, shower doors, new equipment. We're going to come in. We're going to add a substantial improvement, and we're just going to make it better. And we're not going to touch the pricing. And they were like, "What?" And we're like, "Yeah." And you know, and then we go in and then we look. You know, then we then we dive in deep and we find out certain things that aren't you know that just aren't kosher to us. Like, all right, the coaching is really good, but. We needed to change it over a little bit more of a systematic approach. Um, there's no 24-hour cancellation policy. There's just little things that are falling through the cracks. So you've got to turn around and you've got to do a really good job of being organized and being patient and saying to yourself, OK, listen, this is a change we're going to make, but we're not making it till August 1. This is a change we got to make, but we have to make it in the fall. So you go through your entire wish list and then you basically determine – what you want to prioritize and focus on now and what down the road, what changes are we going to make? And you know that's what it's been and it's been great. great. I, I love it because I think a lot of people would go in and say, listen, this is – you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong without observing first. Without God. like you said, it was a successful business. It was they were doing okay already, and they, you know they just kind of needed you guys to come in and you know obviously put your stamp on it and try to maybe organize it a, a different way. And you're not made. You didn't make changes. When did you take it over, Don? I took it over. I want to say our opening party was June. It was like June seventh or sixth yeah. or something. We took it over about a month before that. Okay. So what we turned around and we said was, you know, unless something's a disaster with the staff, which it wasn't, not even close. Um, the one thing we're going to do is we're going to take about two months to sit back wait and observe. And we went in there. I think the uh, an advantage that I had was I had an older coach that worked for me in the past that got a great opportunity to move into this facility. And uh, he went in and he did it. So when I went in and I knew he was working there, I had someone that I've been tied to for 10 years and he was the head coach over there. So immediately, you know, I had a guy in there that was on the inside and, and I had this other great, great trainer. His name's uh, Jason. Um, and, and, and he just – he's been fantastic. So these guys I, – I was what I was impressed about was how much they p- participated in you know just day-to-day business stuff opposed to training stuff. So at Drive, I expect – a 495, I expect the guys just to focus on the coaching. Over, over there, they were focusing on other things to help make the business you know, special. So you know, there was things that I took from 495 and I brought in there and there's things I learned from 443 that I'm bringing into 495. So it's been, uh, it's, it's been great but two very, very, very different models. Very cool. Love it. Love that you kind of went in there and didn't just, just you know, try to – do what you you know like a lot of, even even when uh, uh, we we've talked about this on the podcast with other coaches even guys who go to a new team in the in the pros and they just come in there and they it's like a wrecking ball and it doesn't work you got to just sit back and uh, get to know everybody's name and get to know the members and so very cool awesome um, culture is so important. Culture is so important. I think sometimes we put too much emphasis onto the program and onto the training and wanting to put our stamp on things. But without a good culture, in my opinion, you don't have a good business. Yeah, and it always starts from the top because I can always – and I've said this before to you is one thing about Drive 45 is – and I was there yesterday getting yep. some work done from Kyle Balzer. Um, and, you know, we were, we were t- talking about you. We were laughing. You know, like like Donnie always has a smile on his face, you know. And, you know, there's a lot of energy pumping through that. It's so much of your energy pumping through that place, you know. And everybody's always so friendly when I walk in and um, always asking me if I need anything, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, and that that's important because people, you know, when they walk in the door, they need to feel that. So, uh, you guys definitely have created that, that really uh, – uh, the culture that that's needed uh, to be successful. So, um, 
and and anybody now can can kind of experience that. And let's talk about your inter- we seen it. It's internship slash mentorship slash. Yep. You know, like you said, it's a good point. I mean, at first you thought it was an internship, but it's really is it more of a mentorship because it's really for anybody. Give us the rundown for your mentorship program. Well, yeah. I mean, first off, it is it is paid. Um, it's um, in my opinion, it, it, it's almost the blend of a of a three month trial with um, with learning the ins and outs of the business. There's a lot of things with this program that, you know, and I'm not knocking any other coach that I just think that you're not going to go and learn at, at other spots. Um, we take a lot of time from a business standpoint. We'll show them how to run, you know, the mind body software. We'll show them how the cryotherapy works. We'll show them how, you know, operations at the front desk, you know, even, you know, yesterday we have our weekly team meeting, you know, we're sitting down. One of the guys has to present to the whole team now afterwards. What do you think? Your eye contact could have been a little bit better. Your posture, you seemed a little nervous. These are things I want you to work on. This is not just about coaching. This is not just about going on, designing a great program and running you know, a class to help improve the margins for that gym owner. This is about giving an experience to a coach who wants to catapult his or her career to another level. And I think a big problem out there is we become really complacent. We go off, we get jobs. You know, Maybe a coach at a certain point is making you know, X an hour – and at a certain time, he or she's going to tap out. It's just going to be like, ah, what's next? And I think a lot of these coaches are, are, are feeling like, well, you know, why would I go do a mentorship program? I'm a level such and such. I mean, you're going to do, you should do a mentorship program because you can always learn something. And trust me, in three months of your life can potentially set you up for a great job. You can grow with a great brand or you can learn some things and open up your own facility. And, um, that's really what it's about. It's it's not only about getting these coaches in here working, getting them to where uh, they're receiving you know coaching experience. They're learning under guys like Charlie, myself, Chris Wykus, you know all the coaches. I mean, it's just something where we are such a tight team. We pass off clients, which is a very abnormal thing. Even me. I mean, you know, I'm working with some of the biggest celebrities on the planet. You know, and I'm I'm handing off guys to my other coaches like you know Jim Parsons and Scarlett Johansson and. You know, all, you know, names and I can go on and on and on about. So most coaches would feel almost a little insecure about that. And the way I'm looking at it is, no, let me give these guys exposure. You know, there's a trust I have with them. You know, they're not going to run off with them. I'm not worried about that. You know, I, I'm more concerned with giving them experience. I'm more concerned with helping their growth. And it's been great. I mean, I've got coaches here that have been with me for, you know, since the beginning that are happy that I don't want to go anywhere that they are doing little side business gigs and, you know, I'm trying to help them out with and they're, you know, facilitating a great need for me but right now with this new young blood these new young bloods coming in it's exciting like they're 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 hungry they're they're like get me on the floor let me show you what i got you know let's talk business maybe i have some ideas and again i don't play favoritism if you come to me with a great idea and we want to put some money in it that's what we're going to do it's very cool and i'll say two things on that i think i love um, I got a great kid that rents from me, Ed Miller, and uh, Ed, Ed has a degree in the business, uh, you know, exercise science. Um, he's interned at Syracuse, the Franco's, a bunch of different places. But sure. at the same time, you know, he doesn't have that business experience and he's learning that now, which is great to his credit. He's really been trying to learn that piece of it. Um, but it's hard to just learn from a book. You know, it's hard. Like, so I'm trying to teach him some things as well. But, you know, I love that, you know, they're coming in there. And it's not just, you know, a couple of weeks. It's also a, um, it's three months. And it's paid. So they can kind of make a living. So that, sure. number one, you know, that, that part of it's great. Number two is I think... You're a good example of the fact that I always tell young coaches, look, you need multiple streams of revenue in this business. You need to have different things going because a lot of times, you know, just trading or just opening your business is not going to do it. And you're a perfect example of that. you got a lot of stuff going on. So I think being exposed to that is a really important piece of it. And then this, is my, this is my entire talk at Perform Better in Rhode Island Saturday. It's the 10 commandments. It's the 10 things that I know that coaches, chiropractors, physical therapists, they might be doing, but they're not doing it on the scale that they need to be doing it. There's a consistency. There's a level of resiliency that you have to have day in and day out because in this line of work, man, you can get crushed. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not good enough to have a celebrity client. It's not good enough anymore to make a thousand bucks an hour. It's not because what's going to happen? Someone gets sick, a relative dies. You want to go on a vacation. 
And out of nowhere, you're not only losing on that opportunity, but you're losing on the money it's costing you to actually live. It's like a double negative. So there's things, there's balls. And I, I said it at my talk last year, you got to throw balls in the air. I'm just showing you a really organized way to do it. I'm showing you a little bit of a system that now day in and day out, you've got to pay attention to this. If you don't want to pay attention to it, I don't think there's any shot. I mean, obviously, we all get lucky and you know, sign specific deals with specific companies where, yeah, you can make that type of revenue. But if you're one of those guys right now or girls that are starting out in the industry or someone that's been into it for a while and you're saying, all right, what's next? What is the – you know, what, um, what is my approach? You got to come to my talk. Great stuff, Donnie. I want to – can you remind us uh, – we're going to have a link on Shrankwitz Podcast and we're going to post this information on Shrankwitz.com. But just for some of the listeners, where uh, can they find out more in, uh, more about the internship? Great. So you can go to uh, driveclubs.com, www.driveclubs, plural, dot com. Um, and under it, there's uh, an area that says, you know, internship program, mentorship program. You click on that. There's all information. Um, there's also, um, my, um, my director of education, Chris Wykus, uh, Chris dot Wykus, W I C U S at driveclubs.com. You can reach out to Chris directly. Um, there's a little bit of an application process. We want to get you in here, have you meet. You, you know, meet the team. It's really important that as a team, we all gel together. Um, I, I, every person that we bring in here, we are, yes, we are somewhat of a family in here. It's, it's important to me. That's, that's culturally something that's really important. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's an incredible program. It's going to be three months of their life, but I, I, I think for what we've seen so far, it's going to open some great doors to some great people and, um, just exciting to meet everyone. All right. Great opportunity right there. So, Donnie, thanks so much for coming on. I will see you uh, in Providence this weekend. We really appreciate you coming on and talking about this and hopefully uh, getting the word out about the internship program and and just the great opportunity you guys have over uh, at the Drive Clubs. Anthony, you're the best, brother. It's always great seeing you, and, and, and thanks again for having me on. All right, now it's time for a special segment. And today I got Super Trainer from Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning on Kevin Carr. Kevin's also the founder, co founder of Movement as Medicine, and he's one of the co founder owners of the Certified Functional Strength Coach Certification. Kev, thanks for coming on today. Thank you. I like that. I like the title, Super Trainer. That's good. There you go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to get you on a because uh, I was talking to Don Saladino today. He was on the show. And Donnie, had, they had started this kind of internship slash mentorship at Drive 495. Um, and uh, I thought it was really interesting. And then I was like, well, I got to get you guys on again because – You've really expanded your educational platform, and that would be, you know, you don't only have internships, you now have uh, the performance training mentorship, which you've always had, but then you you guys are traveling now for, so somebody can get a customizable um, uh, mentorship as well, right? And then and then a two-day mobile mentorship, not as customized, I'm sure, but yeah, um, yeah. I'll let you explain that, but let's talk about the interns, like... You have four different semesters of interns, right? How long, you know, how does that work? How long ahead of time does somebody have to apply? And when, what are the times for that? Well, it's been, um, it's, it's gotten more and more competitive. It's, it's, it's actually pretty amazing. So um, we typically like for, so for instance, if you want to intern over the summer and that's like from the second week of June through about the third week of August, People have to get their applications in if, if, if probably by March, um, and then we'll start to review. And then we bring people in for interviews if they're if they're local kids. We ask them, you know, could you come in and, and meet with the whole staff? It's kind of like a um, a team interview, and we all just kind of share reflections. And if they're not um, local, we ask them to submit like a video, um, kind of just explaining why they're passionate about this, what they're interested in learning about, really, so we can get a feel for personality. Uh, more than than anything else, because then we kind of know if they'll fit. So I mean, it's, it's it's a pretty good lead time before we take them, and we yeah we do four semesters uh, throughout the year: so fall, winter, um, spring, and summer. And in summer's definitely the most competitive, and it's also the most demanding as far as time goes. It's more of like a full time uh, morning till night, so like you know six in the morning until the gym shuts down at night. Whereas the other semesters are kind of like part-time in they're like afternoon because that's when our, our athlete groups run 
uh, during the school year. So there, it's typically midday until close. So uh, where it actually works well because some people can't always commit to a full um, full time internship for for you know three four months and, and be able to be here all day long. And some people have to work jobs and things like that. But yeah, I mean we we uh, pretty much always have a set of interns, and I would say like our our business wouldn't be able to run here uh, uh, without them, but it also serves them as a great educational opportunity. Wow. Then you guys have also had a lot of uh, employees come out of that, right? Yeah. I mean, we uh, we pretty much hire almost exclusively from the internship process, which is it's great for us because um, it allows us to essentially have like a three-month interview with somebody um, prior to, to hiring them. And, and, you know, we always say like people can look at in an interview and they can even look good for the first couple weeks of an internship, but then you get a feel for someone as a coach when after they've been here for a few months, you're like, okay, this person really would fit on our team uh, from a personality standpoint and they would fit with our athletes um, as well. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really how we hire. So at the end, you know, if, we're, if we, we need staff, then we'll, we'll see people and be like, hey, you're up. And then, you know, if, if we're looking back and we need people, we'll go back through our internship files and, and search for people and see if, if there's anyone who's available. So. Very cool. I think Donnie just said the same thing in, you know, in terms of it's almost like a trial period. So very, very cool. Yeah. Um, you guys have a performance training mentorship, um, and you have one coming up in September. Tell us, give us an overview of what that entails, how many days, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. so the one we have coming up is uh, September 19th to uh, September 22nd. And that's, uh, this is going to be the mentorship kind of model that we started with yeah, years ago before I even was even here. Um, and it's four days. Um, you know, nine to five. Um, and it's, you know, lecture time as well as is hands on practical time. So, um, we have a bunch of like four or five set lectures, um, kind of taking you through, it's a good introduction to like the MBSC philosophy, especially if you're like a performance coach or a personal trainer who might be familiar with us, but wants to really get, um, kind of an immersive experience. Um, we kind of go through a bunch of different lectures as well as, practical breakouts where we, we take you through the program and go through progressions or regressions, similar to a lot of the stuff that's in the CFSC course. Um, and then we pair you up with coaches to, to coach with groups. So you can kind of see, you know, in the element us, us coaching athletes. And then, um, it, you, it's really, people always say like, wow, I, I was, they're almost tired by the end of the week because you, you get, uh, you're here for full days, like with the coaches and, um, and yeah. really with us from beginning to end. So, nice. um, yeah, and uh, you get a lot of Q&A time with Mike as well as um, with Bob. So if you're a business owner, um, Bob can provide some, some really good um, – some business information and perspective um, from someone who's been you know, in the office day in and day out here for years. Yeah, I think we – even on the podcast, we we forget to mention Bob sometimes. You know, Bob's an integral yeah. part of MBSC, you know, Mike's yeah. main partner. And we, we do mention him only because we always say – we talk about great partnerships being really where two guys or two girls are going to be doing different things or a guy and a girl, you know, uh, you know, so they're going to kind of have different focuses and Mike and Bob kind of provide that. So it's, it's pretty cool. And it's a great thing to see for people who do want to open their business, how that relationship works as well. So, uh, very cool. So you guys, yeah, obviously you cover everything and, uh, we have talked about that before in the past. Yeah, September 19th to September 22nd, you guys do have a couple spots still left over. Very cool. Um, Kev, now this is the interesting part. Now this is where you kind of come in as well over the last couple of years, you and Brendan and Marco. Uh, you guys will – I can have a an MBSC mentorship at my place, right? So talk to us about – Hosting a mentorship and maybe the difference between the two-day mobile mentorships that you guys are doing as well. Yeah. So we kind of had a demand um, from people who said, like, I really want to, you know, come up and and, ha- and get education for myself and my team. But maybe, like, the cost of travel or, you know, just the amount of time for travel, like, wasn't ideal. And they'd say, well, could you come to us and let's let's do, like, a, a course at my place. And you know, so we said, well, why don't we have, make like a customizable, we call it a mobile mentorship or just like a custom mentorship that, that we can do. And we've done them even at our gym for people who just wanted closed courses just for their, their staff. And so what we do is we just, we kind of consult with, you know, we did one, um, down, Brennan and I did one in New York. We've done, Brennan's done them in all over too, out, out West where he is as well. And we'll just kind of consult with the, um, the business owner and the, the staff and, 
say like, okay, what are you really interested in about what we do and what do you really want to get to help your business? So like we'll send out a questionnaire and do some coaching calls and, and kind of get an idea of what they really want and then build a curriculum, I mean, based around the stuff that we already teach, but maybe we can, we can tailor it a little bit towards, you know, the, what they really want since it's, it's just them. So we've done two days, we've done three days, we've done four days, both on site or off site. And then we, we kind of put together the, the handout materials, like the booklets specifically for, for those people. So we can kind of give them the most personalized, personalized experience we can. Absolutely. Um, now let's talk, well, I just want to remind everybody, you can go to bodybyboil.com forward slash, or just go to the education tab and all this is there. The, uh, all, everything about the internships, how to sign up, the performance training mentorship, host a mentorship, two-day mo- mobile mentorships, and obviously you can always email me or we'll have a link to that also on Train Coach Podcast. Kev, let's talk about the ultimate Mike Boyle newbie slash junkie who wants to get into Mike Boyle stuff. Obviously, the Strength Coach Podcast, the sultry sounds of the Strength Coach Podcast, the first place to start, free, it's free. Second place is strengthcoach.com. Uh, that's kind of our next little level. Um, what's next, though? Would you say CSFC first? And then a mentorship, and you know maybe the performance mentorship, or is it performance mentorship then a CSFC? Is it? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, hey, Automobile University with Anthony Rana yeah, on yeah. Uh, the Strength Coach podcast, but uh, no, I think you know th- there's definitely overlap. I I like to tell people, you know, in, in an ideal world, if you were a college kid, I say do an internship, right? Because I mean, you get immersed in education, right? And, and you, you spend day in and day out coaching and that, that's personally what I went through. Right. Um, but if you're someone who's, who, you know, can't commit that much time, I think a mentorship is a a great way to start because you're, you get that same feel of an internship in a sense that you're here all day and you spend time with coaches, you spend time with our athletes. Um, and, and you get, like pieces of what are in the CFSC cert as far as um, the hands-on progressions and regressions. And a lot of the lectures are very similar. Um, and then the difference with the CFSC is that kind of the, the continued kind of support and the um, – you get – it's like a very intensive as far as the education goes for the full eight-hour day. But I think if you're someone who like really wants to like, hey, I, I just want to dive into – you know what Mike Boyle's all about. I think doing the mentorship is is really good because you're you're here for four days and you're really like kind of living it. So, absolutely, um, good stuff, Kev. You got Mike wouldn't be able to do this. Mike and Bob certainly wouldn't be able to do this without you guys. Uh, you guys have really expanded what uh, what he's been able to offer between you and Brendan and Kevin and and Kevin. Um, you guys have done a great job. So uh, thanks for coming on today and kind of giving us the rundown between uh, the different uh, types of education that you guys do provide. So we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's always uh, always a pleasure. All right, that's going to do it for episode 188 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Parr, Rob Milani, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Don Saladino for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement. Alan Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Brett Jones and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. And of course, you remember you can join strengthcoach.com and have access to the site for just one dollar three days just a buck after the three days if you don't love the site simply cancel your membership and you won't pay another penny once your three-day trial is over and you become a member you'll be able to download coach Boyle's two books designing strength training programs and facilities as well as advances in functional training remember if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group we have a special membership offer for you up to 50 percent off depending on how many people you got Check it out at strengthcoach.com. My name is Anthony Renner. You can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.